Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's installment of the Edison Research Lunchtime Webinar Series, Ask Me Anything on Digital Audio. We'll get started now, and I will hand it over to Edison Research Senior VP, Tom Webster. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm here with uh, Carol and Mike and Marsha and Jan uh, and Cindy and Peter and Bobby and Greg and Alice and Sam the Butcher. Uh, we're all here for uh, kind of an experiment for us uh, and, and ask me anything. Uh, and it really is. I, I, I hope this is informal and fun. Uh, and today's topic is, uh, is anything really related to the world of audio. That could be radio, could be podcasting, smart speakers, audiobooks, uh, anything that goes in your earballs. Uh, we've got a whole crew, uh, just a, a portion of the super talented team at Edison that I work with, subject matter experts all, uh, to take some of your questions. So a couple of just uh, very few housekeeping things. First of all, uh, we are taking questions solely in the Q&A panel of Zoom. So if you have a question, uh, pop it into the Q&A panel, not the chat. We won't see it in chat. Uh, so please do that. We will obviously try to get to as many as we can. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions uh, about things outside of audio. We, uh, we are going to focus on audio today, but if you have questions about uh, Edison or us or, or some of the other things that we do, that's fine also. Uh, you can address a question in the Q&A box to one of us specifically, or you can simply address it to the Edison bunch and, uh, and we'll, we'll make sure it gets answered by the appropriate person. Uh, and then finally, the most common, the money question of any webinar, is this being recorded? Will it be available later? Um, it is being recorded. I don't know if it's going to be available later because if this is a shambolic disaster, we are going to bury it uh, well under the rug and you'll never see it again. Uh, but let's, let's hope for the best, shall we? So um, again, if you have questions, go ahead and, and pop them in the chat box. Uh, but I want to start with a sort of a general question to the assembled multitudes uh, here at Edison. Uh, since we've all been generally in lockdown for the last three months or so, um, you can see I'm in, still in my apartment here in Boston. Uh, many of my colleagues are scattered around the world. If the world is New Jersey, um, that's that is the world. And you know, our listening habits and listening patterns to things have certainly become altered. Uh, and Laura Ivy, I'll I'll just start with you. Um, in general, thinking about kind of all of the listening that we do and and how we allocate that listening. Uh, Certainly there's a lot of listening that's done in car and, and for many of us, I haven't seen the inside of a car in, in months and months. Uh, how has the, the kind of overall share of year been impacted by quarantine? Um, thanks, Tom. Well, great questions. I know we all have the questions, same. I did see a car recently for a little bit of time. There was a radio in that car, um, which was something that people were curious about because we know that uh, you know our, our recent studies have shown people are, are having um, fewer radios in their homes. We know we have radios in cars. We have all these smart speakers in homes, et cetera. And so what did that happen? What would happen to that when our patterns were disrupted with work and, and home and school and so forth? So what we found in our share of your study, so share of years, our study, just for those of you who aren't familiar, um, our diary based study that uh, we do four waves a year and we can look at audio habits of people um, ages 13 plus all across the country. So in this study, what we found was that the location of listening shifted dramatically, as one might expect, to the home. So um, we found that a, a great deal of listening was done in home versus other places. We found that um, at work went down. Oh, we have a graphic, thank you, Steve. So you can see that uh, you know, during the disruption, at home shot up, car went down, work went down, um, and other went down as well. Now, we asked people where they are, not what they're doing. So a lot of those people at home were clearly working, but they were at home. Super. Um, and I'll just throw this out really to anyone. I, I know Larry and Randy, you've both uh, spent a lot of time with Share of Your Data and uh, Megan Lazovic as well. Uh, what has that done to radio consumption? Because we know that radio is kind of the king of the car. Um, and with, with uh, in-car listening having been naturally decreased, What's been going on with, with AM, FM radio in that period of time? Anybody jump in there? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So uh, good afternoon or morning or wherever you are, everybody. Um, 
it was very interesting in our update this year of the year uh, that Laura was talking about. So you saw the graph, uh, the huge shift in listening uh, location. Uh, what we found interestingly was that if we looked at uh, what they listened to um, uh, within each location, it didn't really change terribly. Uh, so the, the change that we saw in this quarter, in this updated um, report from Share of Ear, was that just what Laura showed is where they were. Once they were in that location, the results were actually quite similar. So since radio, a huge part of their listening is in the car to broadcast radio, AM, FM, and to Sirius XM, uh, they did go down. They had less listening uh, in this update of Share of Ear as compared to uh, what it was before the disruptions of this COVID-19 period. Um, but um, the, the percentage in each location was kind of the same. So that does seem to imply that if and when uh, life here in America kind of regulates and goes back to some approximation of what it was like before these disruptions, uh, likely it, the results will go back to what we were seeing previously. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, the, what our study shows is that radio listening is very, very car dependent. And um, if car time goes down, radio time goes down. And that's, that's basically what we saw. We didn't see a lot of change within location. So we didn't see, for instance, uh, radio listening in the home go up as a percentage of time in the home. It's just total at home listening went up and radio's percentage stayed the same. So it's at home listening did go up just at the same proportion as everything else. So a quick follow-up uh, really for the, the share of your team. Uh, Maggie in the Q&A asked, uh, during the lockdown, did you see radio listeners switch their commuting in-car listening to the station's digital stream on smart speakers in home? Uh, I think largely we've addressed Maggie's question, but specific to smart speakers, did, did that consumption change at all uh, in terms of share of ear? Okay, I think I can take that one. Um, and we do have, this is a really good question. And this is a question that um, regardless of the pandemic conditions, we have been looking at this over um, the past couple of years and how smart speakers affect radio listening. So I know when I walk into my home office every day, I say, Alexa, could you, I'm not gonna say it now, um, could you play a certain station? So what we see, and there's a graphic, Steve, if we wanna put this one up, about the vast majority of radio listening still takes place over the air. I hope I'm answering the question that you're getting at, is how much listening is taking place over smart speakers. So um, the, the vast majority is still taking place over the air. We're looking at, right. So, so you can see here that of the listening to AM FM radio, and this is trending back, you know, we're looking back six years, the vast majority is still over the air, 9% streaming. If you look at just the COVID-19 conditions, which is your question, we hit 10% streaming. So during the pandemic, we still had 90% listening to AM, FM radio over the air, 10% was listened, um, the streams were listened to. Does that cover Super. it? Super. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Thanks, Laura. Uh, our friend Matt Deegan from, uh, from the UK has checked in. Uh, and he writes, you guys do lots of research for radio and for podcasts, uh, so you get to see how consumers are reacting to both of those mediums. What should radio people learn from podcasts, and what should podcasters learn from radio? Uh, that's a super good question, and I'm, I'll take a crack at a, a little bit of that. If anyone else wants to kind of uh, chime in, that would be great. Um, you know, what uh, what should podcasters learn from radio? Uh, I, you know, I've worked with uh, morning shows for 25 years. Uh, you know, Elvis Duran had done some work on the Howard Stern show, done some work for uh, some other large syndicated morning shows. And uh, the amount of prep work that goes into those shows, the ability to produce hours of original content every single day uh, is something that I think, you know, any podcaster should look at uh, as a serious investment, as a serious commitment to actually producing a quality, engaging entertainment at a, on a repeated basis. Because the work ethic of, of some of the folks that do, you know, even like the Dan Levitard show on ESPN, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, the work that goes into that to produce just great original content every day. It's hard work. And, it, you know, podcasting is getting harder in the sense of, uh, I don't think there's a necessary discovery problem, but there's a getting your show discovery problem. 
uh, and the work involved in that, I think, is, is pretty intense. Uh, as far as what should radio people learn from podcasts. I have something uh, there too, Tom. Well, <laughs> jump in, jump you, in. Well, Meg you Lazarus. can finish your thought, but uh, <laughs> I, no, I, no, go I, ahead. I talked at the radio show um, a couple months ago about the secret to uh, TSL, longer TSL. And um, I picked on radio a little bit, sorry guys, for their amazingly long commercial breaks. And I think something that podcasting does really well is uh, they're, you know, they're, they're talking about their sponsors. Um, the hosts are, uh, you know, drawing from their lives and it, they make you believe that you actually, they actually use and like the product. And the commercial breaks are 30 seconds as opposed to 13 minutes. Uh, so I think radio uh, would be better served if they were a little more creative and with their, with their sponsorships and didn't take their listeners for granted. Well, and we've also seen with podcasting that the the shift in the balance from music to spoken word has been kind of you know marked over the last four or five years, and and podcasting's had a big part of that. Turns out we actually like spoken word uh, if it's if it's produced well and given to us in an entertaining fashion, and I think uh, podcasting has kind of reminded us of all of that. Um, I have a question for uh, Nicole. I'm going to send this one to you. It's it's. Uh, there may be, I think there may be something in Infinite Dial uh, to address this, if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, but Sean Lyle asks, what is the evidence that having on-air talents posting on station social media actually increases on-air ratings? I know Terrestrial can support digital, uh, but does it really work the other way around? Basically, is the effort and danger worth the benefit? And I think we've asked a number of questions about people following, uh, following radio personalities on social media, following... Uh, any kind of talent on social media, whether that's important, whether that drives consumption. Uh, anything ring a bell there from some of the past infinite dial work that we've done? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I think we may have asked about following people. Perhaps last year we did an online study, an online component of infinite dial. So if you give me a few minutes, I can take a look and uh, see what, what results we had found from that. Yeah, okay, so, fair enough. Uh, we have a question here about dynamic ad insertion. How do you see dynamic ad insertion develop in the future? In the German market, for example, players like Spotify have had big problems implementing this technology as their customers complain that they're paying for not receiving ads. Uh, and I don't know if any, I, I, have a, I have a spicy hot take on this, but I'll, I don't know if any of my colleagues wanna jump in on this one. Spicy hot take it is. Um, I. I so I think dynamic ad insertion is uh, is one of the keys to the successful monetization of podcasting and, and streaming. Um, I think we're still in the early days of it. And for those of you on Facebook, if you remember, you know, five years ago, your Facebook ads were terrible. The ads you were the, that you were served up in Facebook were all like one weird trick to shrink your stomach and mortgage at the same time. And they were just uh, incredibly crappy ads, right? And you don't see those anymore because people, it's not the tool, it's, uh, it's, it's not the wand, it's the wizard, I think, with dynamic ad insertion. And as people get uh, more and more savvy about not treating it like it's you know, remnants uh, and you know, just, just sort of bottom of the barrel advertising and actually realize that it's a place for your talent to work, it's a place for relevant messages uh, that can be targeted to the relevant audience, uh, I think, gradually those differences will will fade away just as the advertising on Facebook has gotten a little bit better, I hope. Um, let's go back Tom, up here to- I'll throw in, I'll throw in one quick uh, thing. I think the, both the questions, or two of the questions we've gotten so far sort of wrap together the, what the, what radio can learn from podcasting, what podcasting can learn from radio question with this question about dynamic ad insertion. I think that, and this point has already been made, but I'll magnify it, which is, uh, I think a lot of people who look at podcasting as an extension of radio uh, want to um, deploy and, and employ a lot of the same sort of radio things that they've gotten used to. And I think that radio people need to maybe understand better that podcasting is a different medium or it's a different, it's not just radio that's pre-recorded. and um, understand. So, I think it's very important that radio people think hard about what's the same and what is different in podcasting. But um, 
you know, and everyone, Lord knows Edison Research is, is committed to seeing the podcasting sector grow as any entity out there. But if the vision is, oh, in, in the future, uh, podcasts are going to sound just like commercial radio in the United States sounds. I don't think that's compatible. I don't think it can get to its full potential if it, in, in its future, it sounds the way that commercial radio sounds today. So I, I do think those two questions are sort of wrapped together. And dynamic ad insertion obviously has awesome potential, but it also has creates visions of uh, problematic sounding things within the podcasting world. Yeah, uh, just a comment from Sheila Clark came in uh, in the Q&A. If a radio station is FCC licensed, there are strict rules on how a sponsorship can be presented. There are no rules for podcasters who actually can become infomercials. Uh, and to that, I would say not, not the good ones. Um, I think the market will probably sort that out. Uh, here's, a, here's a fun question from our friend E.B. Moss, a um, uh, great writer in, in, the, in a variety of media topics. Uh, and E.B. asks, crystal ball question. Will the use of voice now even available in Twitter drive more use of digital audio and podcasts versus over the air radio? Um, and I, you know, we've certainly done studies on, on the rise of spoken word and, uh, and through things of share of ear and things like that. Uh, Megan Laz, Megan Lazovic, I will, I'll go to you first on this one and then anybody else wants to jump in. Um, what are we seeing in terms of, uh, spoken word and how that's changing media habits. And, uh, and I don't know if anyone else has played with the, uh, the now the new part of Twitter that lets you actually record some audio. I'm going to be using the hell out of that, I think. But uh, Megan, what do you what, what do you see and what's in your crystal ball? Well, uh, hi, EB. I actually saw your tweet about that earlier today. Um, um, that was quite funny because the, they were talking about um, how you can uh, use audio in, t in Twitter ads in an ad, but then the ad actually didn't use the function. Uh, so that was funny. Uh, but anyway, in terms of uh, this technology um, helping digital audio, uh, we've been studying um, uh, voice for the past, what is it, um, four years with the Smart Audio Report for NPR. And it's actually been pretty amazing watching this technology grow because when we first started studying it, it was just about the smart speaker we were asking people about Alexa and Google Home. Apologies if I set that off in your office or your home office. Um, and now um, our survey has been getting longer and longer because we're going to have, we have to ask about this technology everywhere. Um, as, as this technology is embedded in, in your microwaves and refrigerators, that does leave more opportunity for digital audio to be played. And um, if people are using that opportunity, then certainly you'll start hearing more digital audio in more places. Um, in terms of spoken word, um, I do have, um, I have one slide that I want to show. Uh, Steve, if you can pull that up. Um, it's the sort of the time of day that people are listening to spoken word. Maybe this is a little off track, Tom, I apologize, but I, I've been looking for the chance to show it. Um, this shows when people are listening to spoken word throughout the day. Um, and that's peaking at 7, 7 a.m. During, during the commuting hour um, when, I guess, radio stations have their morning shows, there's more news content. Um, I'd imagine if people are accessing spoken word in new places, that, that might change over time. We do know um, we just released the quarter two of Share of Year, and we know um, because people have been at home and the behaviors have changed a little bit, um, this graph looks much different. Uh, and um, right now there's, you know, in quarter three of last year in Cherevere, it was peaking at the 7 a.m. hour. Now there's like little peaks throughout the day. There's a peak at 9 a.m. and a peak at noon when people are listening to spoken word on their lunch break and another peak at uh, the four o'clock hour. So lots of opportunities uh, for spoken word as it sort of seeps into other parts of people's world. Mm. Uh so uh, before we move on to another topic, uh, Laura Sylvia, um, we've been talking a lot about spoken word here. Have we just have we just stopped listening to music? I know you recently presented some data uh, at for Music Tech, I believe. Um, what's uh, what's happening in the world of music uh, throughout all of this? 
Yes, and actually um, speaking to Evie's question a little bit more on the audio, the, the music side of audio, um, and, and Steve, I have, I have a graphic for this too, that would be great to show. But yes, we do see that smart speakers um, are definitely changing behaviors. So um, when we ask, in our infinite dial study, when we ask respondents um, the audio brand they use most often, 28% say Spotify and 24% say Pandora. So that's together a little more than half of the market of audio brand used most often. And 8% say Amazon Music. But when we look at those, these numbers among those who own a smart speaker, that 8% nearly doubles to 15% who say Amazon Music is the online audio brand they use most often. Um, so it's important, uh, there's increased opportunity to produce audio for these environments. and. Um, that's sort of some of the shifts that we're seeing. And anecdotally, anecdotally, we are seeing people gathering around a device again, listening to audio in their homes or wherever they have these devices. Um, so those are some of the different shifts yeah. that we have seen. Super. Uh, so uh, Gabe Soto is on the call with us and he works with me on the podcast consumer tracker team. Uh, and here's a question that I, I know we have seen some data on this in the tracker. Uh, and I, I think, Gabe, we've probably talked about this, but Leslie Krongold writes in, given the pandemic, are more people listening to health slash self-help content or escapist type content? Uh, and we, we looked at that fairly closely, actually, when we looked at kind of the differences from March to April to May uh, in terms of the genres of podcasts that were popular in our tracker. Uh, anything from that, Gabe, that, that uh, rings a bell? Yeah, um, so there was an increase in self self help content and genre that we saw during the pandemic and the outbreak in the beginning, um, and Tom, I'm not sure if this is how we ended, but in quarter two or quarter one, I'm not sure if news also went down, um, but that's something you might be able to give some light on. Yeah, it's funny uh, listening. It's a it's an analogy that we've used a lot here. Um, about kind of media consumption in times of a, of a crisis or a, a, a large discontinuous historical event as we have just had, uh, it kind of shakes everything up like a snow globe and the flakes settle down a little bit differently than they were before. Um, and we saw certainly at the very beginning of the of quarantine, news shot up, self-help shot up, sports went down. Um, but a lot of those things have kind of really regulated over time as, as people kind of settle back into uh, I, I don't like the phrase the new normal, um, but let's just say they've settled into into something different. Um, so some of those things, especially now with sports coming back, we've certainly seen a, a big resurgence in, in sports podcasts again. Um, but there, you know, there was no question as Gabe, as you mentioned, that there was an absolute rise in self-help and uh, health and philosophy as we all ask ourselves, what does any of this all mean? Uh, Larry, I'm going to pose a question to you that comes from uh, Dick Taylor. And Dick asks, is the reason that over-the-air radio fares poorly for streaming uh, due to its repetitious spot breaks that eliminates many of the over-the-air material when listening to radio on the stream? Uh, and I don't know if you have a, a, a research-based comment on this, a spicy hot take, or just some Larry Rosen wisdom. Well, uh, so I can first confirm what Dick says that uh, the share in Sharevere when we look at uh, on, on say phones or on um, computers or, or even on smart speakers, the share of the time that people spend on those devices that goes to radio content tends to be very, very low in particular on the phone where it's, it's in the single digits percentage. Um, so Dick is the premise of Dick's question is entirely right. Um, I, I, th I think the spots and the spot loads are part of it. I think on the streams, when people are, are um, putting out a different uh, piece of content on the streams as compared to what they do over the air, often the spots can be very repetitive and, and radio still in many cases is not perfected uh, replacing spots and making them different uh, on the stream. And I'm sure that absolutely is a factor. Um, I, I think the biggest reason, though, is that um, you know radio apps, whether they be aggregator apps or single station apps, they just are not, I think, for a lot of people, quite as fulfilling an experience as apps that were sort of designed 
around the experience of being an interactive device like a phone or a computer. So, you know, listening to a linear stream sometimes is what people want, but especially in the, with regard to music, um, products like Spotify and Pandora and YouTube and Amazon and Apple, et cetera, uh, where they can um, be much uh, more choosy about what songs they play, where they can uh, skip songs, where it learns about their tastes and personalizes, um, often has way more variety available to them. They've just proved to be better products for music consumption for a lot of people. And um, so there's quite a number of reasons why radio has not been terribly competitive. I will mention that back to where we were a little while ago, spoken word radio does do a little bit better than music radio. So uh, if you are a sports talk station or if you are a public radio station uh, with news and information or a commercial news and information station, those have tended to be more competitive and get a higher percentage of listening on digital devices as compared to music radio stations. Super. Uh, there's a couple of questions on podcasts and podcast advertising uh, I want to get to uh, in total here in just a second. But before we leave that topic, um, I, I, you know, one of the things that we often uh, will hear from people, maybe we'll hear it from uh, buyers, maybe we'll hear it from analysts and, and things like that. Uh, uh, Megan Bartan, this is something maybe you can talk about, is, you know, what's, what's happening with the kids, the kinder? Uh, with Gen Z, right, have they uh, are they still listening to radio? Have they completely gone to streaming platforms? Uh, you know, what does that what does that universe look like? And uh, Megan, I know you recently did a whole project on this. So while we're talking about you know radio and streaming and, and that whole market, I don't want to leave that topic without uh, finding out some of what you learned. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I uh, recently presented at the virtual NAB conference, um, Radio's Roadmap to Generation Z. That presentation can be found on our website. Um, but as for their overall listening habits, so if you take a look at their share, their total share of all listening, um, they are digital first people, and that shouldn't be a shock to a lot of us. Um, like 44% of their total share time is spent listening to sources like YouTube and to um, Spotify, Pandora, things like that. Um, but if we look at their time spent listening um, to all sources in the car, uh, it jumps from 18% of their total share to 48% of AM, FM radio, uh, of their AM, FM radio listening. So yeah, they do listen to radio. It's just in the car. So overall, um, their share is a little bit smaller, but they do actively listen to radio in the car. Super. Um, and again, for our, uh, for some of our viewers who don't know, a car is a thing that we used to use in the 21st century, a, a mode of conveyance uh, to get to offices and things like that. Um, a couple of questions here about podcasting, and, and I'm going to sort of combine a couple of these. Uh, Marla Isaacson asks, a key question in podcast advertising is attribution. Can you discuss any updates or trends with attribution? Uh, Rob Byers asks, what will it take to truly understand who the audience is? Will it mean pushing aside privacy concerns? And as a follow-up, will that mean moving to, uh, to islanded platforms? And I think what Rob is referring to there are things like Spotify, where they actually do have targeted listeners uh, because it's kind of streamed to a, an email address and things like that. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I'll just take this one really quickly. I, I think one of the uh, podcasting gets, gets, uh, I think attacked on a number of unfair levels uh, because many of the standards to which podcasting uh, is held are not applied to other media, right? People talk about attribution to podcasting. Well, how do you determine attribution in television? How do you determine attribution in radio? How do you determine attribution in print? And I would maintain podcasting's metrics are, are better than all three of those, frankly. Um, but we are seeing, uh, you know, increased usage of, we do a lot of brand lift studies at Edison where we're actually measuring before and after a campaign. Uh, I know Gabe has worked on a bunch of those uh, with me on the, on the podcast team. Um, and, you know, they work just as well as they do for TV, radio, and things like that. And I think attribution, and I know this is a bit of a soapbox, but uh, attribution is, is something that's been kind of sold to us by, uh, by the five large tech platforms, um, Google, et, et cetera. And to some extent, there is attribution. But you know, if I hear about something on a podcast and I Google that product to find the website and then I buy something, Google got the last touch attribution for that. Uh, and so I, you know, at least it's our belief that actually 
interviewing humans and, and doing human-based research is still a part of that loop uh, to really determine attribution. Um, and then uh, just to go back up towards the beginning, uh, Craig uh, has asked, regarding podcasting, please share some of the best practices you've learned from various studies. Um, and I, I, Gabe, I don't know if you want to chime in on something here because uh, you've worked on a lot of these brand lifts um, with us, but uh, you know, we've certainly seen differences in uh, treatment in terms of is it host read or is it kind of pre-recorded? Uh, but even more than that, uh, is it does it suit the message of the podcast? Um, and you know, we have seen some incredible swings in the efficacy of various campaigns depending on how relevant they are to the podcasts. And uh, I don't know if there's anything, Gabe, that you want to characterize from some of the work we've done there. We may have lost Gabe. Gabe has this sweet headset too. Um, so I know some of the things that we have seen in the various uh, brand lift studies that we have done, um, you know, really have to do with the relevance of the product and the relevance of the message to the podcast itself. Um, and it's not that pre-recorded spots and, and things like that don't work. Uh, it's just that you're kind of operating with a hand tied behind your back, I think, when you have the opportunity to match, um, uh, to match a message uh, sort of natively to the show itself. And just as a best practice, because Craig, I know uh, at your agency, uh, it's, this kind of thing comes up all the time. We've had really good luck with extremely well-known brands, the, you know, big national uh, quick service restaurant chains, big national retailers, uh, getting the advertiser to use, uh, if, if not a different sort of uh, brand, uh, you know, to at least put some kind of native messaging that's specific to the podcast in there. I know we did one uh, brand lift study for a large national restaurant chain where they used a, a message uh, for a, a, a lunchtime service that they only used in the podcast. And in that brand lift study, when we asked people uh, before and after, we gave them three different messages that that restaurant actually uses, but it's the one that they used in the podcast that, that popped, you know, by multiples uh, over the other two. So anytime you can do that, I think certainly uh, improves. Um, here's a question for uh, Nicole. Nicole and I have done a lot of work on the Infinite Dial Canada and the Infinite Dial USA. And our friend uh, Matt Kundal has asked, were there any glaring differences between Canada and the USA in the Infinite Dial surveys that you recently completed to either radio or podcast. Uh, so Nicole, what did we see? Yeah, well, I mean, the craziest thing we saw was that most things were nearly identical. I mean, you look at each slide and Canada and US have so many similarities, but the main differences um, I would say would be uh, what type of online audio services they're listening to. So uh, Pandora doesn't exist in Canada. So uh, there's more listening that's going towards Spotify uh, than is going uh, to uh, Pandora. So um, also because Google Home got to Canada before Amazon Alexa, you saw that uh, ownership of Google Home is higher than Alexa, which is the opposite here in the US. And because of that, uh, listening to Amazon Music is lower in Canada than it is in the US. Um, and then podcasting consumption is pretty much the same except if you look at monthly podcast listeners in Canada, they are more male and actually older than they are in the US. So those would be what I, I found to be the biggest differences between the two markets. Super. Um, so we had originally scheduled to go for a half an hour and one of the many reasons why I could never get a job in radio is because I'm terrible at the clock. Uh, so we're a little bit late, uh, but you know, I think a few of us are willing to, to answer a couple more questions before we, uh, before we uh, call it a day here. Um, let's go to, let's see. Uh, Steve Goldstein, our friend Steve Goldstein from Amplify asks, hello all, any sense of how flash briefings are doing in the Alexa environment? Are people going through the process of activating and how is listenership holding up? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick part of that first before I uh, hand this off maybe to uh, Megan Lazovic. Um, in terms of flash briefings specifically, that's the kind of thing that we really kind of track once a year, maybe twice a year in, in just an overall usage of them in the smart audio report. Um, in terms of how 
uh, their the component in share of ear to the flash briefings. We're not as granular as that in share of ear, but uh, but Megan, is there anything else about uh, spoken word and news consumption on smart speakers that 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 we've learned recently? Um, nothing I can that speak comes to something top too. of mind. Oh, Meg, by all means, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other so Megan, we, I'll leave it to the other Megan. We feel that the most recent um, iteration of the Smart Audio Report that we partner with uh, NPR for um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I know we're still in it, but really in the thick of it when we were uh, at the uh, beginning of March. Um, now, we ask people how, um, if you ever listen to news on your smart speaker, and that's gone up from 55% this year, or sorry, it was 55% this year, and now it's 62% this year um, when we asked them, you know, during the pandemic. Um, so there's a little bit more news listening. Um, we didn't, that doesn't necessarily mean flash briefing, but there is news listening happening on the smart speaker while we are stuck in our houses. And I can say just in terms of measuring it, um, we, uh, when we first started measuring our people using flash briefings on devices, um, we would ask specifically about the brands. Um, it's gotten more and more difficult um, because consumers aren't necessarily thinking about, is this content a flash briefing or not? Like, we'll just ask for the daily and they'll get the daily. Um, there, you know, we might be focused on whether or not it's coming from a flash briefing or from a, an app or a skill, but the consumer doesn't think about it that way really they just they just ask the device until they get their content and larry you, you were going to add something i was just going to clean up one thing that the other megan said which is we feel that that's at the end of march not uh so when we were deep in the COVID thing and i'll also add that uh we just put out some data from the updated chair of the year uh and this doesn't speak directly to flash briefings but uh, we did record by quite a uh, significant margin the highest share of all audio consumption happening on a smart speaker uh, that we've ever recorded. Now, that is clearly in part uh, because people were spending so much more time at home and the overwhelming majority of smart speaker listening that we record is in the home. Not all of it, but, but almost all of it. And so as home increased, uh, smart speaker usage increased alongside of it. But that does speak to, uh, you know, among the things that we'll say were changed by this moment in time, uh, you know, more people were using their smart speakers more, and it would stand to reason that maybe this is a, a bit of a pivot point then uh, for this uh, form of listening. Uh, so a, a couple of quick ones here, uh, which, uh, which I'll take very quickly, especially since uh, Nicole had to, to drop off, and then we'll get to something on uh, multicultural uh, podcast consumption. Uh, Michelle Margulis asks, true crime listening has apparently declined during the pandemic. In your opinion, do you think this has to do with growing awareness of ethical issues surrounding sensationalism of the genre? Do you expect that we'll see it come back after illness and death are no longer at the forefront of listeners' minds? And what do you think a podcasting ecosystem without true crime would look like? Um, for the last part of that, Michelle, it would be a barren wasteland, a seething vortex of nothingness and despair. Um, it's a huge part of the podcasting ecosystem and actually in the tracker, we have seen it come back. Um, and I suspect it had more to do with the lack of me time uh, at the, especially in the first month or so of quarantine uh, with, with true crime being, I think a guilty pleasure for so many than, than perhaps it did any ethical concerns. Uh, but it, is, it has certainly come back. Uh, and Dane Craig asks, when you talk about listening in the car, is there any data that shows that listeners are actually listening to AM FM or are they referring to the quote unquote radio device for all audio and just mentioning that they are listening to the radio connected cars offer all platforms that run the audio through the car system. And actually, Dane, we do have that uh, evidence, certainly in the infinite dial. Uh, we know that when we ask people, what do you listen to most in the car? 50% still say AM FM content. Uh, we also measure this fairly granularly in our share of ear research. Uh, and in fact, the, the vast majority of AM FM listening is to the over the air uh, terrestrial broadcast and not to the streams uh, the, or the internet simulcasts of those. And Tom, um, I think he might be a bit referring to the fact that sort of in everyday parlance, people will say, oh, I listened to a podcast on my car radio. And so they're, they, they are equating any sound that emerges, you know, any audio of any kind 
that happens in the car coming from the radio. I feel like the instructions and the questions that we ask in our various surveys work as hard as they can to eliminate any confusion when it comes to that. Um, but clearly that is the way people talk. So we do know that we need to make those efforts to get people's brains to the right, to the right location. So I want to get to a question that uh, Annette is asking, and uh, she's asked, have you seen any shifts among multicultural listeners during this time? And Gabe, we are so close to being able to report on this. Uh, in fact, we're going to have uh, an update on that at the, at the end of this. But uh, what, so what's, uh, Gabe, you do a lot of work on, uh, especially with the, the work that we're doing in Hispanic and Latino research. What, what have you, what, what's cooking? So, Tom, we, we fielded a survey in May uh, of 2,500 Latino adults. Uh, it was an online survey, and we actually found that listening has increased to podcasts since COVID-19. Um, it has also increased within the past year, and those differences can also, we see differences between different populations of the U.S. Latino demographic people who were born outside of the U.S., people who were born inside the U.S., and different age groups. Um, but I think um, we can share that some of that information on June 30th when we, uh, Martina Castro, CEO of Adonia Media, and myself will be presenting uh, at 1 p.m. and releasing some information on this uh, study that, we've, that we did in May. Um, it'll look into the insights and habits of podcast listening among the, the U.S. Latinos. You know, we're a diverse ethnic group. Uh, people tend to group us together, but this study will reveal different aspects. Like I mentioned, um, people who were born in the U.S., people who were born outside the U.S., different generations, uh, parents who are immigrants, um, things, like, things of that nature. Um, and you'll be able to find out how podcast listening compares to the total population uh, during that webinar. Super. Uh, and uh, Annette, thanks for, it, it almost looks like we had pre-prepared this with you, Annette, to, to, to tee this up. If I were uh, a stage mentalist, I would ask, have we ever met? No. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, we're very excited about that, and that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, I have a question here. Uh, Larry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to field this one to you. Uh, to go back sort of to the beginning here, Mara, hi Mara, asked, uh, any digital audio insights for the US versus the UK, both pre-COVID and during COVID? And I know we've talked a lot about the research that we've done in, uh, in the United States uh, during the quarantine. We haven't so much done, uh, I think, UK work in this particular time, uh, but I know, Larry, your, your, your ears are always out there. Uh, you know, what are you hearing from some of our UK clients and, and uh, some of the folks that we talk to in, in ratings and things like that? Yeah, so sadly, I, we don't have any updated data during COVID uh, directly from Edison uh, in, in terms of what's happening in the UK. And um, uh, I guess giving Nielsen its uh, credit, you know, their technology has led them to continue to do radio ratings here in the United States while they were uh, you know, sadly suspended um, because of the in-home placement that they do of the diaries there. So you don't even have uh, a visibility on, on what's going on with that. And I bring that up mostly to, to bring up the fact that uh, we keep in very close contact with the people at Rajar who do a couple studies that are sort of parallel uh, to ours, uh, to both Infinitile and Cherivir actually in, in different parts. Um, so sadly, I, I you know, those are suspended alongside uh, the suspension of the ratings over there. Um, so um, I think for the moment, all of that stuff with the exception of server data is gonna be a bit of a, a void in the UK right now. Uh, fortunately, Share of Year uses methodologies that can keep going here and anywhere else someone wants to do it. Um, the, you know, the, like the Latino podcast study that uh, um, Gabe talked about was done during this crisis and we're continuing to do all manner of work uh, here because our methodologies allow for it. So uh, I know that's a long non-answer to uh, the question, but um, we are as uh, deeply interested in what's going on in the UK as anybody else, but sadly we don't have a lot of uh, visibility there. Larry froze, oh, there you go. Um, 
So I want to uh, I want to bring up just another quick question here. Uh, it's another one from Annette. Uh, it's a super good question though. Um, what role do you see radio playing in this year's elections? And for those of you that don't know, uh, even though this this Ask Me Anything is about the audio universe, Edison plays a very big role in election research. We're the sole providers of exit polling data and vote count data for the major news networks that make up the national election pool. Um, and so some of us that are on this call work on uh, audio, but we also work on uh, on election related things. Um, I don't, Randy, you do a lot of work on the elections and uh, Larry as well. So what role do we see radio playing in this year's elections? And uh, you know, political buying on radio has always been a, a huge part. And I generally, you know, I, this is not something I know the answer to. Well, I'll, I'll try. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's been a tough year for radio sales, uh, for, you know, advertising. And I do think uh, it, it could be an incredibly great year, though, for um, political advertising in the back half of this year. Uh, there will be, a, in my opinion, a surprising number of states that will be considered competitive for the presidential election. But there are many, many senatorial elections uh, that uh, will be hotly contested and will have huge amounts of money uh, thrown into them. Uh, so depending on what state you're in and if you have, a, if you're a competitive state, either at the presidential or senatorial level, I think there's going to be a ton of money flowing in. And that doesn't even include all the normal, you know, state, other statewide or uh, municipal elections, et cetera. So I think a radio should be very optimistic about uh, political advertising in the second half of this year. But as always, it needs to uh, fight for the money and show why it uh, can be powerful and change votes and, um, and you know, make its case. Uh, don't wait for the money to flow in, but go to the campaigns, go to the parties and, uh, and get that money. Because uh, you know, uh, I can promise you that your good friends at Facebook and Google and um, many other uh, entities are, uh, are doing that, uh, are making those appointments. And Randy, do you have something to add? Yeah, thanks, Larry. I was going to say that uh, in Sherevere, we actually ask people what party they identify with. And it's interesting that uh, the share to AMFM stays fairly consistent. It's a little higher among Republicans, but it's only three or four points higher than independents and Democrats. So all parties are listening to the radio. Super. Um, Hennick asks, any exciting developments around audio discoverability? Uh, we have some coming out, uh, I believe. Uh, we don't, uh, this is not finished yet, but we are going to have a report on that uh, very soon. Nicole, uh, who had to leave uh, a little bit early, is, is working on that. So don't have an answer for you uh, on this call, but you can expect an Edison answer very soon. Uh, and so for, for, for those of you that are uh, on the panel here with me, uh, Bobby, Cindy, Jan, Marsha. Um, what are, what's your favorite podcast? I need some new, I need some new show ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I've been enjoying oh. during the pandemic is Down in the Hole, the rare uh, rewatch of The Wire. You know, it, it's not the most uh, fun rewatch out there, but it it is enjoyable to see how much I enjoyed The Wire when it came out way back when. I've been meaning to get into that. I, um, for a while, my favorite podcast has been Heavyweight from Gimlet, um, and they sort of check in with people. They, uh, they, they help people visit people from their past and sort of um, resolve some issues that they've had, some interpersonal issues. And um, uh, when the pandemic started, Heavyweight, uh, I think was, that was supposed to be done with their season, decided to release new episodes, checking in with people about how they're doing the, during the pandemic. And when I saw that first episode, I was just so happy. I'm like, oh, I needed this check-in. So that was, uh, that's my favorite. And then they, they became my all-time favorite when they did that. And my two quick recommendations, one is called Tunnel 29 uh, from BBC Sounds. Uh, you will feel that you're in a tunnel uh, in, in the most dramatic fashion. And uh, another recommendation also from a radio entity is uh, from WQXR uh, Radio in New York and from the Metropolitan Opera is, a, is one called ARIA Code, A-R-I-A, ARIA Code. Um, it's uh, a bit of a niche uh, 
play, uh, but all I can say is it may be the best production I've ever heard of a podcast. And um, you don't have to love opera to find this show incredibly compelling and interesting. So uh, if you, if, as long as you don't hate opera, you should check it out. All right. Uh, just a couple of quick ones here that I think we can answer fairly quickly. Uh, Rob asks, is podcast consumption fueling consumer technology purchases other than smart speakers? And I don't, I don't know that we have any data on that. If anyone, uh, anyone's welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but because uh, we certainly have tracked uh, the, the, the Venn diagram, the close association between podcasts and smart speakers, but I don't know that we have tracked um, uh, other sort of affiliated technologies the way that we have with, say, smart speakers and home security or, or home automation. Um, so sorry to, that will, that, will, that will remain unsatisfying, Rob. Uh, Charlie Burney asks, do you have opinions about live versus taped for both music and spoken word? I myself am consuming much more, thank you. Uh, we have uh, well over a decade of, of evidence on that, that the ability to access audio on demand increases the amount of audio consumed. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, and I think that's I think that's going to wrap it all up. So uh, we got some fantastic questions. Uh, so many of you hung in for uh, such a long period of time. Oh wait, someone asked a question in the chat. What is the distribution of podcast consumption between podcasts from established larger media producers versus small independent podcasters? Are people mostly listening to corporate podcasters or the Wayne's World type creators? Um, it's a really good question, uh, which we, we conclusively answer that in the Podcast Consumer Tracker, which is our national measure of the reach of various podcasts. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, you know, there are certainly uh, larger groups like that uh, that are accumulating a lot of uh, a lot of listening, a lot of reach. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, but, you know, nobody's really nobody's got 50 percent of the space or anything like that. I, I mean, there's when we ask people in the podcast consumer tracker, what podcasts have you listened to in the last week, which is how we, uh, how we determine reach and rankings and things like that. Uh, we will generally always get back a podcast or two from a large producer, and we will generally always get back a podcast or two that is extremely uh, niche. So, you know, I'm, I don't think it's any different basically than any other media landscape. If anything, I think the long tail of podcasting is, uh, longer and healthier than things like blogging, for example, when that, that long tail basically disintegrated. Uh, so thanks for that question, Joseph. Um, we are basically at the top of the hour here. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And I, I want to thank uh, the entire Brady Bunch crew at Edison Research for joining us on this Ask Me Anything. We recorded this. I think it's probably good enough to post for later. So uh, for those of you who are interested in, in seeing this later or missed it, uh, you can look for this on our website soon. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, the gift of your time and attention. Uh, stay happy, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon.